Welcome to the Big Movement Podcast. If you're ready to create results and make huge strides in your business, finances, personal development, and health, then you're in the right place. Pushing past excuses and powering through procrastination can be a challenge alone. Here, you'll get the support, tools, and knowledge you need to get to the level you desire in your business and life. Let's get started with your host, Byron Ingram. And welcome to another episode of the Big Movement Podcast. Today we have Jessamine Gibb, who is a master life coach and career counselor who specializes in assisting people that have a history of perfectionism, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, to excel in life and work without sacrificing their well-being. Because when we can get past those things that hold us back, success is truly in the palm of our hands. So let's give a warm welcome to Jessamine. So Jessamine, welcome. Hello. All right. So tell me a little bit more about yourself. How did you get into this world of being a master life coach and career counselor? Because it's, you know, you look at what people want to do for a living. Sometimes it's like there's this list of professions. Hmm, master life coach. That sounds like a good one. (laughs) Uh, Well, basically, um, I went through a lot of trials and tribulations in in my life. Um, I grew up in a single parent family um you know we had a lot of economic deprivation and you know there were some family issues and uh you know I was a bit of a troubled teen and when when I finished my university I came out of it thinking okay you know what do I want to do with my life and I made a pact with myself that I really wanted to address all of the suffering that I had seen you know, during my upbringing and, you know, my adolescence and and I wanted to leave the world a better place than it had been when I came into it. So that was my idealistic, um, you know, passion that I started off my adult life with. And I started off my career uh, working with people in under underprivileged areas, helping them um, get back into work and to move forward in life. And I found that for most of those people, what was really holding them back was that they had no foundational confidence in themselves and they had basically been told their whole lives that they were never going to amount to anything and that they had no skills and you know all of that kind of stuff so I started out working with those people and I moved through different uh, programs and organizations working with different kinds of people that had this that similar kind of uh, thing holding them back and after working in in those industries for about 12 years I decided I wanted to move out and and work for myself doing similar kind of work but with with people in in the private sector. Oh, excellent. And it, it what you mentioned there is so important of how people from all walks of life mm. they end up having a similar thing of being told that they don't have the skills or they wouldn't amount to much of the labels that people then just start accepting for themselves that have no solid basis. Yeah, and that labelling is so fundamental and and it's not about poor versus rich or, you know, anything like that. You could be from the most privileged background and still have been through all of that. You could have still been told that you're not as good as, you know, your brother Johnny and you'll never get anywhere and you're a disappointment to the family and you know, all the rest of it, you know, you could have been through worse than someone right. who's had less privilege. Right. Oh, definitely. Because you, you look at just across society anywhere and you hear those stories of the people that they were told that they can do anything if they believe in themselves, they achieve it. And there was that confidence that was instilled in them from an early age. And they go on to get a full ride scholarship going through college and so forth. Mm. And then the flip side, you'll you hear about the same people and they can, that are told those limiting beliefs mm. and then they adopt them. And then that's all they become. Mm. Definitely. And I think, I think for me, my saving grace was that 
I always managed to somehow, you know, sometimes, you know, almost seemed a bit magical, but I always seemed to have someone around who believed in me and who would, who would tell me, you know, don't listen, you know, you know, for instance, growing up, you know, didn't fit in very well. And, you know, I had a few teachers who to really took time out of their day and they didn't have to, they could have been having their lunch maybe, you know, would t- take time and say, look, you're going to go somewhere, you know, you're not like everyone else, but that's not a bad thing, you know, right. where, whereas at, at home, the message I got was more like, be like everyone else. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No. That now that had to be profound to get a different message at home than versus at school. How did you end up handling that? Because you're hearing two different messages, and so many people go through that exact thing, and where there's this conflict. Mm. Well, I, I guess the thing is that it depends who you are. I mean, everyone's different, but if you're an unconventional person, and I am, and some people just are. And I think there's a lot of us in the entrepreneur space. Um, But if you're unconventional, you can't just push yourself into a conventional mould. It it doesn't really work. I mean, you can do it with a lot of willpower, but you'll you'll run out of steam pretty quickly. Um, And I sort of found over time that there was only one way to go. And I think also on top of, you know, the support that that I got, you know, from adults um, who took the time out to to give me that support. But um, also my other saving grace is that I'm very stubborn. (laughs) (laughs) Now we know. (laughs) So, you know, that really helped. Um, And that also has helped me to be the champion of people who maybe don't have that harder edge that I have, you know, that may be a little bit softer and they they need that support Mm -hmm. from someone else to elevate them and show them all the things that are wonderful about them and help them to package that together to say, look, you are great at this and this and this and these are all fantastic things and you can use them to make this wonderful life for yourself right and and that's so critical to that of how you're able to to leverage who you are in helping people that way because people need that support because some people they don't necessarily believe in themselves until someone with enough conviction jump starts that process yes and that's the discovery that i've had through my career and my life is that you, you see, you know, if you work with people and you are able to get connected with them and make that connection and have the right conversations, you can see that growth happening just visually. You can right. see that realisation, that moment of, oh, my God, wow, I actually am a, a unique and wonderful human being. I'm not this piece of garbage that, you know, my dad or whatever, you know, told me at some certain stage, you know, that there's that healing of, of wounds that can happen. Right. So now you had the support from teachers, but then you had the different message that was coming in from at home. How, like what was going through your mind in terms of like to be able to get through that conflict where you're hearing these two messages mm. and be able to create that breakthrough? Because I think so many people, that's where they get stuck at. They they have a teacher, someone is believing them, but then there's this doubt that's created because they've always heard that one thing from a parent is like, Oh, you know, like, this is the only thing you're going to be and blah, blah, blah. And it's been instilled in them from day one. Mm. How do you, you break that? I I think I had to realize at a certain point, that no matter how much I loved my mother and respected her, and and we do have a lot in common, obviously, she's my mum, right. but, right. but there's a lot different about us too. So 
So I'm I'm much more uh, creative and abstract and um, unconventional than she is, and that that you can't force another person who's got quite a different personality in in certain or different values in in certain ways to see things the same way that you do in right. general um one of my gifts is that i have the capacity to look at life through different lenses and try to put on other people's perspectives and i've worked very hard to build that and it's been necessary through my work because often you know say working in community services where um, I might have had a caseload of say a hundred people who I had to work with intensively it was always between 50 and 100 people um, I had to you know be able to connect with all these different kinds of people and see the world through their eyes in order to connect um, so I can I can see where she's coming from but also accept that that's not the final word if right. that makes sense there's so many different ways of looking at the world and what's valuable and um, how to be in the world there's not just one way is there Oh, no, of course not. I like to tell people that when it comes to solving a problem, having a viewpoint, that there's when there's over 7 billion people on the planet, that means there's 7 billion different ways of coming up with a solution. Yeah, so exactly. And and you have to... I mean, one way I like to look at it is that, you know, I'm quite progressive um, socially, but a lot of people are very conservative socially. And for a while, I was like, no, I'm right and they're wrong, you know. Right. And after a while, I realized that there was a balance being held, mm -hmm. basically. That we kind of needed each other. Because if the really radically radically socially progressive people had their way all, all the time, systems wouldn't be held in place. Right. You know? Things wouldn't be organized. Um and they wouldn't have they wouldn't be able to do the things in a free flowing way that they like to do it because the world would be in chaos right oh definitely and, yeah and it's balance is so critical of that give and take of understanding how do you relate to people of that you know like in that case where you, know, you have the different viewpoints how do you still love your parent but then at the same time, you just have to disagree. Like, nope, sorry, I don't agree with anything you're saying about this label because I'm deciding my own path. Hmm. Well, I just had to realize after a while that she didn't get it. Um, mm -hmm. And that that's okay. People mm -hmm. just don't get stuff sometimes. And, you know, I mean, she would say things like, you know, why do you always have to do things, you know, the most difficult way? Or, or why do, um, you know, or you can't expect people to accept you if you're going to be different. And she would talk as if it was a choice. Right. Um, and it wasn't a choice. That was just sort of the way I was built. Um, and I think the thing is that more conventional people assume that unconventional people are making a choice. Right. But they're not. They're right. just well, expressing who they are. Right. And I think that's the uh, part of society that no matter what, it, it's hard for people to accept that everybody, no matter where they are, they're expressing themselves uh, based on who they are. It's just that people are, some people are taught from the early age, oh, if the, people are not like who you are, you're different and they're there's something special. There's something that's like, ooh, that's just weird. It's a challenge for people to overcome. Yes. Because they can't grasp onto that. And yeah. That is difficult. And I've worked with a lot of people who um, have dealt with the the weird word. You know, that's mm -hmm. something that, that comes up and can be really crippling for people. 
um, because they see that as a negative. Right. And for me, I have had to come to see that as a positive, like as almost a compliment um, because, you know, people would respond to me, you know, and say, oh, that's weird what you just said, you know, because it's an I've said something that they didn't expect right. to hear. Um, and sometimes it was because they were unfamiliar with the concepts and it wasn't anything original to me at all. Right. But, um, you know, I have had to just get over it and say, well, look, some people are just not comfortable with, you know, unexpected things popping up. And that's the way they are. Right. Exactly. And it's about, when you think about that acceptance, I like to use food as an example. It's a way to convey it you know if someone was only used to ever let's say seeing mcdonald's growing up yeah that's all they ever knew and then suddenly someone walks in with a burger king bag and someone looks like what the heck is that (laughs) (laughs) it'd be like the sauce is different and it's got you know the layers are different this is madness right Right, it's (laughs) madness it's crazy like it's still a burger really but sometimes people they can get caught up on the wrong things and it's the same thing when it comes to people. It doesn't matter where people are. That the it's the core things which matter. Like, is someone a great person? Yes. Exactly. Or no. Those things which people have to learn how to focus in on, and not on the stuff that makes us different. Because at the end of the day, we want people to be different. We don't want everyone to be the same. Because you know, there was this movie that came ages ago called The Stepford Wives Club, and ah, uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. You know, like, yeah, that's what happens when everything's the same. It gets kind of creepy and turns into a horror movie. I agree. <laughs> I agree so much. There there are only, there's only, well, there's two classes of people that I'm afraid of. One, mm-hmm. I think everyone's afraid of, and that's sociopaths. But right. the, the other kind are those people who try so hard to be like a model of the norm. You know, so those people who are, like, really perfect all the time, um, as in, like, their clothes are always just perfectly ironed and, you know, like, they have just perfect attire, perfect manicure, um, all the rest of it. So they look great on the outside, but you Mm -hmm. can tell when they smile that it's not genuine. Right. You know, and those people, they just give me the heebie-jeebies because, I, you know, it's sort of like something that's wrapped up so nicely on the outside, but you can tell that there's nothing warm and welcoming Mm -hmm. going on there. But, yeah, like that kind of Stepford Wife kind of impression, definitely. And And I think that that comes from, I don't think there's anything wrong with those people. I think that that comes from an intense pressure to meet social standards um, that those people impose upon themselves. Right. And when you think about social standards, look at how it's influenced by the media that people consume of Mm. what's socially acceptable. If you think about the longest time of, like, here's a great and perfect example. In terms of, let's say, things are profanity, risque, and so forth, you would never see it on, like, especially like in the U.S., on mainstream TV. It was always the, this crisp, wholesome type of entertainment. If it mm-hmm. was a family of all, like, oh, no, it was never anything that was, like, kind of on uh, just out there in the fringes because, you know, people never didn't want to see that. We have to protect people. And mm-hmm. then back in the late 80s, there was that little TV show that came along and broke the whole model called Married with Children. Oh, yes. Yes, and And that was just grotesque the whole time, wasn't it? Right. Everything they did just broke some type of a social norm that was out there. And at first, when you think about it, because it was so different, people were just up in arms constantly. Oh, my gosh, how can you do this? This is it's going to ruin the lives of children everywhere. Like, um, do you really pay attention to what they're seeing anyways and talking about? It's nothing. That's a big surprise. Mm. But now the irony is when you look at TV today, you kind of go, 
gosh, that was nothing. <laughs> well, do you remember The Simpsons when The Simpsons came oh, out? Yeah. Because of oh, all totally. the double entendres, you know, about uh, Smithers being gay and 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 all the rest of it. Um, right. The 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 two level humor, you know, right. where where people the adults were seeing the adult level humor, right, and being all freaked out because it was quite risque, right. But not realize that the kids didn't see any of that. No, exactly. Kids are going to just and and people in general are going to enjoy something about the innocent type humor that people will say, and then someone will come along and say, "Did you?" Like, oh my gosh, your mind's in the gutter. And the person's like, no, it wasn't. It's like, (laughs) really? You went there? And we're we're being totally innocent. But until someone else pointed out, like, oh, that's just not right. It was never at the tip of their tongue. No, exactly. It had to be suggested first. Right. But we have have moved on. So I'm 37. So, Mm. you know, I was a a child in, in the 80s. And I, and then an adolescent in the, the 90s. And the, pro, the progression has been intense, definitely. Um, and it's a real worry for younger people, I think. I don't want to be sort of like having a moral panic or anything. But the amount of um, media that mm-hmm. younger people, um, say teenagers and young adults are consuming which is about um the standards that they should meet and all the rest of it is quite worrying um Mm -hmm. you know the whole instagram thing everyone competing over who's the prettiest and 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 all the rest of it um i i think really takes the focus off what's what's important long term right you know and it's something that i didn't have to deal with growing up and really you know as a young woman with confidence and self-love you know um magazines were bad enough Mm -hmm. let alone having a constant feed of beautiful girls who are all photoshopped but are supposedly like real people yeah you know like coming through my phone 24 hours a day right it's it's the evolution in terms of how people compare themselves to others. And it's, it's existed for the longest period of time. It's just a matter of the methods and the mm. rate of consumption. Because if you yes. think about it, even when you're growing up, there's still that comparison of, oh, who's the, who looks the best? Who's this? Who's that? Oh, definitely. And now it just happens faster. But not only that, it's not, it's no longer just the people that, you're within, let's say, three feet of the people that are going to your same school. Suddenly, it's your whole town. Like, oh, did you see so and so? So there's this this constant competition mm. for people out there, not realizing that the only person someone should be competing with is themselves. Looking yes. in the mirror. Definitely, definitely. You should always be, you know, running the race against your last best time, or you know. Uh, seeing, you know, how you can do better this time ag- against your previous results. It shouldn't be about um, you comparing yourself to other people because you don't know what their background is. You don't know what they're dealing with internally. And with social media, so much can just be, um, well, not manufactured, but it depends who's got the most money for nice photo shoots and it depends who's maybe um, paying money for really good copywriting and all of this kind of stuff. Um, You sometimes can't make uh, good assumptions based on first impressions, can you? Right. It's, you have to hope that the people that are going to be out there, the first impression is a great one. And you just have to hope that it's not a false front. Where it's a Trojan horse. Like, it looks amazing inside. It's burning fire and burning stone or something like that. <laughs> Hopefully not. Right. But you look at how that happens. like Because people want to put on that happy face. Because it's instilled that, oh, you should always put your best foot forward and, and so forth. 
But where people tend to go wrong is that's all they do. It doesn't matter the amount of anguish that's taking place. Mm. They never take the time to fix it. So yes, it, it, it they become hollow on the inside. Yes, and it yes. grows in this bigger problem. Yep, and this is a thing that I'm, I've really been, a message that I've really been pushing is that all states of mind um, have some productiveness to them. And if you're always trying to run away from any bad feelings and just, you know, affirmation, 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 you know, desperately like trying to feel better instead of looking at, you know, why do I feel bad? Um, is there something that I can do to um, take care of myself while I feel bad? If it's, you know, you've taken some kind of blow and you, you know what, what it was. Or, you know, is there something that I can make out of this feeling? Because, you know, for, for me, sometimes when I'm feeling low, I go, okay, I'm just going to take it easy and see what comes out of me today. And sometimes I can be quite creative and come up with ideas that I might not otherwise because my mind's kind of working on it at a slower pace, at a deeper kind of pace. Um, and I think that if you're always running away from anything negative, I think you're actually missing out on the depth of the full range of human feelings. Right. That... And you mentioned it, and it hits it on the head so importantly that you have to take the time to address what the issues are because otherwise it grows. Think of like that, and I think a great analogy is this. If you, let's say you have a small campfire, but it's unattended. Yep. If, and a little spark flies from it into the forest. If no one does anything before you start off, like here's this little small fire that it's, it's using to keep you warm, you're cooking food and all those things. We think about your emotions and things are going on. You can use something to flip it forward, but if you don't address it, what happens? You burn down the whole stinking forest. Yeah, exactly. While you're turned the other way. Right. Yeah. So it's something you have to address. Definitely. And I mean, these things come up for a reason. And, you know, I was talking with someone on, on Facebook not that long ago, and I was saying, that basically sometimes, you know, say you're in a job that you hate or there's a situation with a relationship that's causing you pain or whatever it is, that your, your mind and your body might be sending you a message, this is unhealthy, you need to get out. But the way right. people who are really hooked into positive thinking ideologies in a very religious kind of manner, the way they might address it is there's something wrong with my affirmations and my positive thinking. I need to buckle down and get better at that. But you right. need to you need to be in touch with yourself and know you know what's going on because like you're saying, you know, before you know it that, that forest fire is raging out of control. And the, the little nigglings that are telling you to do something about your situation could be, you know, something much bigger and more dramatic. Right. Exactly. And that's so vital for people to address. And there's different ways of going about doing it. it because I think there's that, with that positive movement, like you said there, people can avoid addressing those real issues. And they're masking it. They feel, feel like kind of like you think about if you go out to dinner someplace, and like if it's a steak or something, you can only add so much sauce to something to try to mask a, a bad flavor. Yeah. That at the end of the day, if it's not good, you could put all the ketchup, mustard, and everything else in the world. It's still going to be kind of crappy underneath. Yeah, exactly. And we need to be honest with ourselves about you know where we're at and any kind of issues we might be dealing with in our environment before we start thinking it's a mental problem, I think. Right. Because it's not... I think some people are starting to feel like it's a moral failing almost to feel bad. 
Right. Because it's getting to be such a big thing to keep your mindset really, you know, positive all the time, you know, and I'm, I'm really, you know, hearing from people that they're feeling like they're kind of suffering behind a mask of being positive constantly. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're like, you know, say it's a social media thing that they're posting, oh, look, I've just gotten out of a domestic violence relationship and I'm in a shelter and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. But, you know, the impression they were giving out the whole time was that everything was fantastic. And obviously it wasn't. And they didn't feel like they could share that with, with anyone. Right. And so how can someone start building up their confidence so that they can ultimately ask for help and let people know what's really going on before it's so far down the rabbit hole where they realize that, that now they tell everybody they're in a domestic violence shelter or something like that, mm. when if they would have said something earlier, it could have prevented things from getting to that point. Well, I think... Um kind of goes back to some of what we were talking about before about labeling I, I think people in terms of getting confidence and valuing themselves need to become aware of um, you know any false labels that have been placed on them that are either un, unfair or outdated um, because sometimes, you know, a label placed on us by family as a child might have been true at the time, but it's not true anymore and isn't serving us. So, you know, any kind of, you know, black sheeping or um, shaming that you might have gotten from your family, you need to look at what you might be carrying around, what baggage you're carrying around about yourself and get right. really aware about what if any of it is actually relevant and think of you know what actual labels you could apply to yourself that do make sense objectively and are positive uh, and I think that that's quite foundational because that is something that you can say to yourself that you can affirm about yourself that isn't in any way kind of um, wishy-washy or anything. You know that these things are true because you can, you know, and, and then you need to also back that up with with evidence. So if you can find evidence for all of these positive things about yourself, then you can say to yourself, I am um, really good at X and I know that that's the fact because I have achieved, you know, Y and Z goals, then you can start to sort of build up a really self-aware and really accurate and positive image of yourself that can battle against either the baggage in your head from the past or anything that anyone tries to do against you in the present. Oh, excellent. So if As... people try to tell you you're stupid, you're, you know, not going to be successful you're ugly whatever um you can you can stand up and say no none of that is true wow that's powerful for people to be able to do that to disarm to disable those false labels because i think that's something that holds people back is they're still holding on to those labels from the past mm. and no matter what it's they, they've done the affirmations and they're saying but i'm this i'm that in the back of their mind, they're still holding on to those things and yeah. they're stuck. Yeah, because I think you have to really, in terms of like affirmations and mantras and all that kind of stuff, you have to, I think, one, really believe in them. You, you can't just sort of say them out of rote. Um, and they have to be in your own internal, what I would call your internal language. So... They have to be originally written by you or um, adapted from someone else's into the way you think internally. Um, and that has to, yeah, it has to be something that you can stick up for. If you were imagining someone 
you know, arguing against it, you would have to be able to find evidence from your life to back it up. Right. Oh, exactly. It's having that frame of reference because when it becomes real to someone, it becomes powerful. If, if someone, let's say they were told that they're stupid their whole life, and then they're thinking, but I'm not stupid. And let's say they, they had a picture of a, let's say, a, a paper they wrote, and they got an A on it. It's yes. being frightened by going, well, I could not have gotten an A if they, I'm stupid, so that must be false. They have to have some type of evidence exactly. to confirm it. Exactly. And in uh, narrative therapy, you would call that an exception. So um, that's in that school of thinking, that's what they do with clients is that the client will say, oh, I'm a person who's always late, say. And then right. they will say, think of a time recently when you've not been late. And then they'll think of a time and go, oh, yeah, I wasn't late last Wednesday when I had a dentist appointment or whatever. And then they'll say, well, there you go. You're not always late and you have the capacity to not always be late. Right. So there's that real evidence. Right, because so many people, they create the labels in justifying a behavior, which is like that, I've, I'm always late, I'm this, I'm that. And if people don't disarm the I am statements, that becomes that reality until there's a catalyst to change it. Yes, definitely. And I think the thing that comes up for me as well is that um, – what I, I see over and over is that people carry around stuff from, and they're not necessarily aware this is when it's from, but they might have been very young and it might have been things that their parents perhaps said out of frustration. So not necessarily like a, a, the, the parent is making an, an evaluation, you know, they're just pissed off at the time excuse my language and they're saying yeah. you know why are you so irresponsible why are you so this why are you so that I mean I think just about every parent has had that moment with with their kids you know um and had a, you know lost their cool and and had a bit of a yell um right. and some people take it to heart and they can carry these things around with them and it can become an emotional trigger unless it's addressed, unless it's, you know, laid out on the table and looked at. Right, exactly. It's something that has to be addressed. And ultimately, when people are, they're sitting on the, the fence, they want to move ahead and they're, they feel that something's going back. Do you think that it, it's beneficial for them to sit down and identify what are all those false I am statements that they've heard those false labels that they might have forgotten about but at the subconscious level they're still holding on to it I think it's beneficial for someone to really dive in and figure out all of them it, it depends where a person is at because some people don't find that necessary at whatever stage that they're at in their journey but if there is pain you know if you feel like there, there is pain and a very severe lack of confidence, then, yes, I, I would advise sitting down and doing a life audit and basically working out, you know, what are the things that I believe about myself and do they serve me? Right. You know, I mean, I, I was, um, I had a session with this amazing woman um, a few about a week ago or so, and, um, you know, she, she, it's, it was just astounding um, how different beliefs can be from reality. She said right. that her belief about herself was, I am not confident. And I said, just think of anything, pull it out of the air, of an example of a time when you have done something that re required confidence. And she was sitting there for a bit, and I said, look, just anything at all. Um, and at first she said, oh, I went on a show ride, and that was really scary. 
And that was her first thought. And then I said, well, hang on. How about this, you know, this job that you do? Don't you do, like, group presentations? And she's like, oh, yeah. No, I stand up in front of people and I, and I pre- present to the group about the projects that we're doing. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, doesn't that scare you? And she said, yes. I said, well, you do it. That means you have confidence. Right. You know, and then she was like, oh, because she has that belief, but there's, there's, no, there's no evidence for it. She lives her yeah. life. She does live her life with confidence. Right. And it's just finding that frame of reference in so many cases, because in just about everybody's life, I think that confidence and other things they exist, but sometimes we just have to be reminded where they are and make that little small one millimeter shift in our viewpoint to see it. Yeah. And I think also we have a false uh, view of what some of the virtues that we would like to have actually are in a human. Um, Mm -hmm. We have like almost like this divine view of what they would be. So, you know, for confidence, we would think, oh, it's, it's this person who just like marches through life and they never have any fear and, you know, they just do whatever they want and they speak up all the time and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and yes, we do see people like that, but that's, that's not the one and only model of, of confidence. You can be quietly confident. Right. And it's good for people to embrace who they are so that way that confidence is at where they are currently instead of assuming that the only thing is confident is someone else's standard, not defining their own standard of confidence. Exactly. Exactly. Because the thing is that some of those people who we might define as the model of what confidence is, there are negative things that go with being extremely brash and, um, you know, speaking over other people and all of that kind of stuff that we might not want to have the negative side of that. Right, exactly. I think a great analogy is if you look at, say, speaking in front of a room of people, that for one person, confidence is just getting up in front of a room of 10 people and they're excited about it. Yeah. But another person's level of confidence could be like, I just closed a room that there was 10,000 people in. Yeah. But like, yeah, there's a different level of confidence there to go from this a small handful of people to 10,000 or whatever that number is. Yeah, and it could be the same person on a, on a on their journey. You know, right. you could start with the 10 and end up with 10,000. Right. Exactly, because the skills, the blueprint that we're using, it's going to be different based on where we are on our journey of the way that we are we have to show up to uh, to be our best in front of 10 people it's going to be the foundation but then to do some of the same things for a larger number of people often we have to grow i kind of think of it about as it's like if you think of sports as an example the mm-hmm. skills that someone's going to play when they're like a little kid like just with their friends even though it's the same sport will be dramatically different and at the level of let's say at the prof- let's say a professional so if you think of soccer like hey you're kicking a ball around with your friends great yeah but to play in the World Cup, it's a total different level of skill. Yes, definitely. Right. I mean, you know, like playing around with your friends is going to help with your coordination and, you know, your gross motor skills and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, you're exactly right. There's a whole le- another level of technique um, right. that would go into professional sportsmanship and – um, or sportswomanship, and um, I, yeah, I definitely see that as a good analogy for, say, right. public speaking, because that those two things at different levels would be right. would be very different between ten people and ten thousand. I mean, you've got to engage the people at the back, right? If you've got the ten thousand, I've done small group training and that kind of stuff. Right. And, yeah, it wouldn't translate that well. You can't do it exactly the same way. Right, exactly. But, de- but definitely doing one would, would help 
with confidence with doing the other. Right, exactly. You're growing into it. You're not going to see someone just one day go, you know what, I got this. They've never done it before. <laughs> they walk in a stadium with 10,000 people going, hey, everybody, I'm here to help. And they've never done yeah. it. There's and that the thing is, process. The thing is as well that what people probably don't get about confidence is that there are, you know, say, musicians who, who play sold out, enormous, you know, stadiums. And they've been doing it for 20 plus years and they still throw up every time before they go out. Oh, yeah. You know, so they have confidence because they're there, but they still have the fear. Right. And people expect the fear to just miraculously dis- disappear. But the the confidence and the bravery, ex- it exists because of fear to a degree. Right. If you right. didn't feel fear, then it'd just be a walk in the park and it would be nothing to you. And therefore, it really wouldn't be an expression of confidence or bravery. Right. Exactly. I think a great way of summing it up of defining confidence is confidence is doing it in spite of the fear that's present. Yes. Definitely. Because that's what's going to make a difference. Just like that analogy, that performer who for 20 years before going on stage pukes their guts out, yep. but they still do it because they might be going, Oh my gosh, like ah, oh, nervous. They've been doing it for 20 years yet. It still scares the crap out of them, but they have to, it's there. It's a process for them that they're able to go out there and do it. Yeah. And I mean that in my life, like say in my professional career, I have just done what I had one mentor who was a, a boss um, when I started my my first job out of uni and she was this lovely older lady from the north of England and she said anytime someone gives you an opportunity doesn't matter how you feel just say yes and work out how to do it later right do work out how to do it, <laughs> right. but but you know just just say yes and keep right. keep on going. You know, pr- keep on progressing. Take opportunities as they come up. Get out of your comfort zone. Right, exactly, definitely. So now, as we're beginning to wrap things up here, what is one thing that you can recommend for people to do? that can help them build their confidence and achieve what they're wanting to do in life? I would say getting really self-aware. Getting really self-aware of your strengths as well as your weaknesses and accepting your weaknesses because you can't be brilliant at everything. And... Even the most admired people on this planet are not brilliant at everything. And yet we still admire them and they're still successful. But right. get, I mean, if you if you need help to get a handle on what your strengths are and what you should really be feeling brilliant about yourself for, you know, get a coach do that audit, you know, of your skills and strengths with someone else who can reinforce that for you. Um, but that self-awareness and that feeling good about yourself, that will really help you get far in life. It's the right. fundamental, it's the foundation to everything else upon which you build all of your, you know, your technical skills for your business or for any other endeavors that you want to pursue because if you don't have that that confidence and you don't value yourself you'll procrastinate you'll um become overly perfectionistic um and you just you just won't be able to deliver right definitely well, I want to thank you for coming on to the Big Movement Podcast today and sharing your wisdom on how people can overcome those things, hold them back, those labels, and build their confidence. How can people 
connect with you and learn more about what you do? Um, well, my website is achievecoaching.com.au and you can see all the services that I deliver on there. I also am on Facebook and I update my Facebook business page quite regularly and that is Achieve Counseling and Coaching. My full business name is Achieve Counseling and Coaching because no one can pronounce my name or remember how to spell it in uh, putting it into a search engine so I've got a business name instead Um, and I'm basically all over the web so you can look up achieve counseling and coaching and you should be able to find me oh excellent well definitely thank you for coming on once again Jasmine for and sharing your wisdom because it's been really valuable My pleasure. It's been fantastic talking with you as well. Awesome. You have a great afternoon. Thanks for listening to the Big Movement Podcast today. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Now that you've surely been inspired to take your entrepreneurial career and business to the next level, you can stop by the website and get more. And if you're ready to boost your business brand, be sure to grab your free report, 7 Easy Steps to Build Your Brand Today.